Hello and welcome back to Real Talk, Come Follow Me. It's wonderful to have you with us on this Valentine's Day week. I know, happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to you. And if you celebrate Valentine's Day where you are, happy Valentine's Day. And if you don't, I wore red just to annoy you. Happy Valentine's Day <laughs> A anyway. lot of red, yeah. yeah. Well, if you were looking for an activity for Valentine's Day with your special someone, we have a surprise for you today. <laughs> Uh, we'll be covering Genesis 18 through 23 with some amazing stories fit for a Valentine's celebration. Stories like, He's, well, it's a continuation, first of all, of the Sarah Hagar Abraham soap opera. So kind of a love theme. I think it's a stretch, but okay. okay. but we'll keep going. <laughs> Listen to this. We've got Sodom and Gomorrah. In this particular set of chapters, you've got, you know, some traumatic things that happened to Lot and his daughters. Also, we have the angelic announcement of Isaac's imminent birth to Sarah. And then we have God telling Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. So, happy Valentine's Day. John. Yes. <laughs> if you're listening on podcasts, you can't see our sarcasm. Oh, mercy. It's not a lot of, no. it's intense stories. It is yeah. intense stories. Yeah. This is just an opportunity, can I just say, before we jump mm -hmm. in. If you feel like you have a dysfunctional family, and you wonder how God could ever accomplish great things through you, look no further than these stories that we're reading in the Old yeah. Testament. Because the Old Testament emphasizes over and over again that God is able to work within our brokenness and dysfunction. Isn't that good news? Yes, it's good news for me. It's good news for me. Someone who's very broken and very dysfunctional. Well, and the title that the church gave for this week for these chapters of study is anything too hard for the Lord, mm. which is in a direct response to the angelic announcement of Isaac's future birth, right? We talk about it in the Real Talk Journal on page 23 that is anything too hard? And anyone that is in our audience that has experienced infertility, I feel like there's never been a year more than this year yeah. to validate that experience. And I think specifically within the church culture where children seem to be coming out of all corners of yeah, all right. places, right? <laughs> yes. um, for our family, it was seven years to have our son and six years to have our daughter. And I remember very well that there's this moment where you're thinking, this is too hard and it's a righteous desire. And I think as we pick up right in Genesis 18, verses 13 to 14, we see that Sarah laughs. Yeah. She's like, shall I it. surety bear a child, which I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And at that time, it was appointed. And I just feel like as Sarah is sitting there thinking, am I ever gonna have this opportunity? Has the blessing, blessing passed me? Am I too far past that point? That yeah. is real talk. Like yeah. that's for all of us, whether it's not infertility for you, maybe yeah. it's something else. Maybe it's marriage, maybe yeah. it's job issues, maybe it's chronic illness, maybe it's addiction recovery, right? That, that this is a week where we can really yeah. dive into the power of God. And we've talked about yeah. it this month already, but. Can I share a Spencer J. Condy quote from my cousin Spencer? Of course. Shout out to it's family. Cousin Spence. Shout yeah. Out cousin he says, Spencer. Yeah. He says, and the Lord changed Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai's to Sarah. And when he was nearly a hundred and she was 90, they were promised that Sarah would bear a son to be named Isaac. Mm. I love that God uses names to create that connection, right? Yeah. And really, in our terms today, we would say, that's too hard. Juxtapose that yeah. to Mary, who wasn't waiting and waiting to be a mom yeah. and wasn't old. Yeah. And I think that's an important distinction to make that for some of us, maybe having children was easy, yeah. but maybe children came sooner than you wanted, right? Yeah. Well, I'm thinking for you, it was what, late 20s? Right? Yes, 27. For uh, Soraya, it was, and she was 90? Right. And, but these are all just, of course, little microcosms mm -hmm. that sort of capture this principle that all promised blessings come to those that continue to strive to keep their covenants mm -hmm. now or later. And, you know, I know that 90 years seems a long time. I know that when we say, well, in the next life, that may be little consolation yeah. to some people, but it is nonetheless yeah. true that right. these blessings are always available. And when that miracle manifested, I mean, I jokingly say that in the church, seven years of waiting to have a baby is like 2,722 <laughs> years in the rest of the world. It's like dog years, <laughs> That's funny. right? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. I mean, That's I think funny. your your perspective that you just brought up is important to understand that, yes, 
in the scheme of things. But yeah. I think God is super aware, too, that for sweet Mary, who's young, that was overwhelming. And for Sarah, who had been waiting and waiting and waiting. When they handed me that 10-pound baby, you know, it was like the seven years of pain washed away. But I can hear our audience, some, that are saying, I'm yeah. still waiting. It's right. way past seven for me. And um, I don't know how that miracle is going to manifest. But right. this is the week to say, keep it happens. Keep your eyes on yes. God because there is nothing too hard for Him. I love it. Now we're going to jump. We're going to change gears. I'm so excited for this part of the <laughs> Well, temper your excitement. No, I am. But, but what we're going to try to do here, and we invite our audience to really kind of tap into the spirit as we go through this and consider, because we're going to try to offer a reframe of the Sodom and Gomorrah narrative. A paradigm shift. Yeah, a little paradigm shift for sure. And I believe it, it will have lasting effect for our viewers. I, I do too, and I hope it does. Um, so it is common to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah as though it is the historical precedent that gives us license to uh, maybe treat our LGBTQ brothers and sisters a little less cordially. We've used this story of Sodom and Gomorrah as a club in many ways to really inflict some hurt and pain on very sensitive demographics. Um, here's, here's the point with this, the beginning of the reframe. <clears throat> to say that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed exclusively and primarily because of homosexual behavior is at best an oversimplification <clears throat> and a misrepresentation of the actual text itself. I mean, the men, it's the men of the city, right? Let's give a little context. So Lot, who lives in Sodom and Gomorrah, invites these three heavenly messengers to uh, hang out with them at his, at his house in Sodom and Gomorrah. Members of the community see these men coming into his house and they try to break down the door and they say, let them out, uh, give them to us so that we can, in essence, sexually abuse them, okay? And Lot's like, no. So we're talking violence and yes. sexual assault. Yes. yes. And he says, no, and they say, well, give us your daughters. And the Joseph Smith translation is very important here, where it says, Lot says, no, mm -hmm. you can't have them either. So what we're dealing with here in Sodom and Gomorrah, let's, I, I wanna throw out some terms and phrases that we're familiar with, and we'd all agree are egregious and terrible. We're talking about sexual misconduct. We're talking about sexual harassment. We're talking about sexual assault. We're talking about sexual abuse and rape and sexual sin, which Christians would define as sexual activity outside of the marriage covenant, right? right? And uh, not central to one demographic. No, not, no, not at all. And so um, I think that all Christians and non-Christians alike would in general just agree that these are all categories of things we need to put up protections against, right? And keep at bay in any community. And so when to we- To have a thriving yes, society. Yes, and so here in Sodom and Gomorrah, we see similar to what happened with Noah and the ark, another divine reset. Mm -hmm. When we realize that it's an unrestrained, abusive sexuality in part, we're gonna, we're gonna see that it goes way beyond that, that was occurring in Sodom and Gomorrah, you start to understand more why God may have seen that it is best for this particular community to have a divine reset and again, change the location of mm -hmm. their classroom experience to because the spirit world. Because as we world. shared from Elder Maxwell, right? That's he right. intervenes when our agency is no longer working right. because the sin is so abundant. Right, so two things. I, I thought this was interesting. There are some Bible scholars, this was fairly new to me, this particular perspective, who uh, point to Matthew 10 and Jesus' use of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wait, say that one more time because I think our listeners will be like, wait, did he just say Matthew 10 and we're talking Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> right, but we are talking about Jesus in the Old Testament, Jehovah of the Old Testament. Well, when Jehovah was alive on earth, this is how he referenced Sodom and Gomorrah. He's talking to his apostles and he says, whosoever will not receive you, mm -hmm. he says, depart out of there, you know the, the rest, shake off the dust of your feet. And he says this in verse 15, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So some Bible scholars point to this as Jesus making the point that the main sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was how inhospitable 
and cruel they were to, to people other. that visited their city and to each other. That was the main sin. And maybe how they received um, church leadership. Right, Ab absolutely. They like to juxtapose this or set side by side with Abraham and his receiving of the messengers in his tent in previous chapters and his cordial and respectful treatment right. of them and Lot's cordial and respectful treatment Which and reception of them, them. Into, their into his house, right? Yeah. I particularly like the prophet Ezekiel. Listen to what he says. Okay. So, so think about this. This is how they used Sodom and Gomorrah anciently in terms of a historical precedent that or we're going to— Or a barometer. Yeah, that we're going to use to teach a principle. Okay. He says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, meaning sort of abundance and excess. Abundance and idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty, meaning prideful again, and committed abomination before me, which may be a reference to the unrestrained abuse of sexual practices. Or abuse in general. Right. Therefore, I love this phrase, I took them away as I saw good. Because as to I go back good. at the beginning of this month, right? right? This is the nature of God. It's for our benefit. Right, absolutely. And so God says, I just, that was just a reset was needed, mm -hmm. and so I did. And so I would love to see in our gospel doctrine and Sunday school classes more references to Sodom and Gomorrah in light of how they used it anciently and scripturally. Be like, man, let's not commit the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's make sure we're helping the homeless. Hey, let's not commit the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's not be so prideful and hurtful. And here's my final or sort of- Or haughty. Or haughty, right? I like yes, that I word. Yes, I like that word too. <laughs> All of my students think that means like good looking. Oh. Because you're like, you're a haughtie. Okay. You know what I mean? So they're like, were they really good looking, Brother Fawson? Shout Fossum? out to Brother Fawson's no. students. It's not. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> anyway, here's my last point on this that I think is very interesting. Most people I know in the LGBTQ community possess a certain group of strengths. And those strengths include things like kindness, cordiality and hospitality, acceptance, non-judgmental, all these things, right? These are the very characteristics that the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah lacked. The very reason why they were destroyed, those attributes they lacked, the LGBTQ community in general possess. And I have some very personal experience with this. I have a brother who's gay. He's married to an amazing man. And if you were to just sit down with him, just for a minute, you would walk away from that conversation, counting them as some of the greatest people you've ever met. And so isn't that an interesting point? Isn't that an interesting sort of ironic twist for me as I look at how the scriptures use Sodom and Gomorrah and how we use it? And the way we use it just isn't fair and it isn't accurate. And, and I, ho I hope it will change. I am so grateful you shared that and I am so grateful for those in that community that have blessed my life and taught me about the Savior because yeah. they have been willing to wrestle with paradoxes and teach me about Jesus in some really beautiful and personal ways. So thank yes. you for teaching that. Of course. Can we jump to another huge thing? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it, man. So here, Abraham and Sarah <laughs> finally have this beautiful son. Their Miracle only, baby. Yes, Isaac. And in Genesis 22, 2, um, the Lord speaks to Abraham and tells him to take his only son to the top of the mountain of Lan Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. How could he, right? How I could can he? hear it already. Yeah, I can hear and, it already. I, and I've had these conversations with people where this is really a stumbling block story in, yeah. in their understanding and nature of God. I think it's important to look at um, a, some rabbinical, rabbinical literature about yeah. the the backstory here. So Abraham miraculously escapes his own dysfunctional family story. He has a father who is an idol worshiper and tries to sacrifice Abraham in a furnace. And I think that's a, such an important note for me. This is a story that changes how I feel when God asks me to do a hard thing. Hmm. 
Because if you think about how Abraham is being told, take your only son, you've waited so long, hike up this mountain and offer him as a sacrifice, the trauma and PTSD trigger of that when he had had mm. in a situation where his own father tried to do the same, I can only imagine. Asking him to relive it. Relive it, right? Yeah. Um, in my own journey in mental health, I have used various tools to help with recovery. One tool that has been super helpful with trauma is EMDR, and it may mm. be a familiar modality for yeah. our audience. And if it's not familiar to yeah. you, you, you can, can just Google search it real quickly, it. There, EMDR. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's very And there's a lot of therapists right now that have received training and yeah. certification in this area. It's helpful to understand EMDR in that it really does take you with a therapist there mm -hmm. through your trauma so that your brain finds a new pathway through that trauma right. and a response. Mm -hmm. In my heart, Abraham and the story of sacrificing, sacrificing Isaac has always been an EMDR therapy session. I love that. God love has literally animal. said, I want you free from this trauma. I'm going to ask you to hike back up that mountain with your son. Reprocess re what happened it. previously. And there will be a bullock in the bush. Right. Except it's going to be a more a positive outcome. Yes. <sighs> So that you can come down free from that trauma yeah. and knowing no know, yeah. knowing more about who yeah. God is. Side note too, the land of Moriah is where Isaac was supposed to be offered, is also where Gethsemane and Galgotha were where the Savior was crucified. Beautiful. So um th those are my thoughts. Yeah. And I feel I like you it. have so much you could share and add I to that. I love I love the the helping him heal from his past trauma. I know it sounds uh, counterintuitive that the way we get overcome trauma is to sort of go back into mm -hmm. it and just reprocess it with guided help. Abraham, of course, had God in this case. Mm -hmm. And we come out the other side. I was just talking to someone today, as a matter of fact, who had just received some EMDR treatment yesterday, and she was telling me how healing and amazing it is. Mm -hmm. And so someone brought up the point on my faculty during lunch that here we are judging God like he's he's crazy what kind of God would do Why that Why would he ask so much yes, of us he's a, what a maniac what a you know how inconsiderate imagine if God really is if we use this reading in this angle trying to help heal Abraham of his past trauma and here we are misrepresenting God again mm -hmm. throwing all kinds of aspersions and things at him and and here he is I can just see him up in heaven like guys I'm It's all for your benefit I'm, I'm trying to help him <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean but we just see through yeah. A lens I, I definitely believe that God is always trying to help us be free of trauma and heal. That's always his ultimate why. Yeah. One more uh, quick alternate angle, okay. potential reading of this, Okay. Uh, is that Abraham, how is he able to do this? Uh, first of all, I, I want to go back to something that I just saw. If you go to the... Um, Come Follow Me study guide this mm -hmm. week, it makes this statement. We don't know all the reasons God commanded Abraham to sacrifice right. his son Isaac. Can we just recognize that just for a minute, right? And we probably should have started with that disclaimer right, first. Right, right. <laughs> the record is fragmentary at best. We're not sure what details were missing. Through translations. Yes. What, what happened between the time Abraham left the tent to the time the knife went in the air? So many details we don't know. But... Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 mm. and Genesis 22 give us just a little gem. something to think about. And this isn't the definitive reading. Right. We're just going to give a potential lens, right? It says in Hebrews 11, 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Look at verse 19. Mm. Many... Uh, Teachers of the scriptures have taught this, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. So in other words, Abraham is like, I don't know what's going to happen here, mm -hmm. but I know that even if I have to drop this knife, Isaac is the, the child of promise. God can bring him back to life. God's going to do something. I'm coming back to my tent with Isaac. I will step out of the boat and walk on the water yes. with you, Jesus. I don't know what this is going to look like, yeah. but I'm going back with Isaac. Right. A uh, member of our faculty, shout out Catherine, who you know. Who Catherine is is a super fan, and yes, we love her. Yes, we love Catherine. Catherine pointed out that in Genesis 22, 5, Abraham says this before he's hiking up the mountain with Isaac. He turns to the people that were with him, and he says, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And so it just kind of points to potentially this moment of, this awareness anyway. He 
he just he didn't know what the outcome was going to be, but he knew Isaac was going to be yes. back with him when he returns home. And something I just want to add real quickly is that this just wasn't Abraham's sacrifice. We say that Abraham was learning something about Abraham, but Isaac was also learning mm -hmm. something about Isaac because he was 30 plus years old. Abraham is not this able. This wasn't some little no, kid. No, no. He, he would not be able to bind Isaac unless Isaac. So what happened between the time that, a, that when Isaac says, hey, dad, where's, where's the bullock? And he says, well, son, actually, and this is what's going on. And and emotional. Okay, so this sacrifice moment never would have happened unless Isaac would have received a similar witness that this is of God and I'm going to move forward with faith knowing that it's all somehow gonna work out. So Isaac was also learning something about Isaac, and would he have been able to do that had he not had trust and faith and an accurate perception about his, his dad's character? Similar with us and our view of God when he asks us to do hard things, what do we really believe about God? Mm -hmm. What do we believe about him? Do we believe that he is a God that just requires arbitrary sacrifices of us? The principle I would like to emphasize with this, and I wanted to say it very clearly, <laughs> no spirit-directed sacrifice. Right. And I say that very carefully. Right, because others have used that. Right, mm -hmm. for uh, leverage for abuse and right. things like that. Right, and manipulation. No spirit-directed sacrifice is arbitrary, meaningless, or wasted. And you were teaching me in real time that as Moses had to step in to the sea for it to part yep. and then the ground to be dry. Yep. We don't know all the ways in which God can make things happen. And I think we can talk, you know, in our families and with our friends this week about where we have felt asked to do those impossible things. Yeah. Maybe there wasn't always a bullock, but yeah. did you have the strength to yeah. go forward and do it? And the trust stuff? that and in the, the end, yeah. it works out. Should we give them an invitation? Yes. It's me. Oh, that's you this week. Good, <laughs> great, good, because I couldn't think of it. Well, it's, a, it's back to what we started with in this dis sensitive discussion about Sodom and Gomorrah. And I really hope that the spirit of what we have shared today um, changes and helps a paradigm shift in your own thinking and learning. And maybe this week it changes your worldview and how you behave this week. Maybe if you view Sodom and Gomorrah as uh, a bully stick towards a certain group of people, potentially this is a, a reframe for us to look at ourselves. Are we being kind? Are we sharing of our abundance to those in need? Are we extending ourselves and opening our doors to welcome people in? That's our invitation this week. We are so grateful you have joined us for these honest and vulnerable conversations each week on Real Talk, Come Follow Me, and we'll see you again next week. Do you like Real Talk, Come Follow Me? Then like and subscribe. <laughs>